Hello everybody, time to do chapter 8, our chapter on memory. This is a companion chapter to the learning chapter, because if we learn, the information has to go in our memory. If it's in our memory, it means we must have learned it, so it's a companion chapter to the other one. So with that, we're going to learn the major types of memory. We're hopefully going to learn some memory techniques that might help us to uh, learn more effectively and recall it when we wish to. So let's jump into it. We will define memory as a system that encodes, stores, and retrieves information. The nice thing about this particular definition is that if you learn those three key components, you'll also know the three stages of long-term memory. A nice two-for-one uh, arrangement here. Can you identify the three basic types of memory? If you said sensory, short-term, and long-term, you were correct. If you have trouble with sensory, you're definitely not alone. But when you study, put a little bit of extra emphasis on that first step. It's the one that will give you trouble on the test if any of these do. Short-term memory also has another name. Do you know it? If you said working memory, you were correct. So the three types of memory are sensory, working or short-term, and long-term. Let's learn about sensory memory. Picture it as a holding system. For example, a sound in the environment will fade, but it's rather like your sensory memory can still hear that sound for a moment that it does not physically exist. Or to consider your visual system, perhaps a little fly is passing through your visual field and it's rather like your eye can still see that image for a fraction of a moment when it's already passed out of your view. Let's see an example of sensory memory. Momentarily, I'm going to ask you to click one of the two uh, web addresses below. If you enjoy the activity, you can click both. If one's enough, then that's fine. What you're going to see is flip art uh, in flip books. You'll notice that the images, when they're flipped, seem to be continuous, rather like a motion picture. It's not the fastness, per se, that's the essential functional feature. It's that as each slide comes up, your sensory memory holds on to it. And so while the next slide is moving into view and the other one is moving out, we're not aware of it because our sensory memory is holding on to the first image. So it's a nice way to see how sensory memory, the visual type, operates. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this and I would suggest at this point that you write down one or two of the artists or the name of the clip that you find to be the most interesting because you're going to be asked to provide that later on for attendance and participation. This slide reinforces the idea that each sense has its own sensory memory. Some of the terms I hope will look very familiar such as gustatory and olfactory. This particular slide prefers the term tactile as opposed to our touch or skin or somatic term. It does introduce two new terms, that of iconic and echoic memory. Content in our sensory memory is constantly being replaced by new content, but a small amount of it does get passed to our next memory system, that of short-term memory. This is where the memory is processed, hence the term working memory. In class, we learned that the average person can recall seven items, hence the magic number seven. But there is great variability from person to person. Most people fall somewhere between the seven plus or minus two range. The amount of time that information can be stored? According to research, a little under 17 seconds. So when we did the activity in class, you might have felt, as I kept giving you new items, some of the initial information slipping away. Let's test our short-term memory. You may have already done it in class. If so, uh, feel free to skip this second testing. Or if you like, by all means, do it again. So I will read 10 words to you, wait till I'm done, and then write down as many as you can remember. The order does not matter, but again, wait till I'm done reading. Here goes. The words are siege, Lamp, hill, 
happy. Book Rabbit Pencil Street Wallet and Banana. You may now write. Let's see how you did. The words were siege, lamp, hill, happy, book, rabbit, pencil, street, wallet, and banana. Short-term memory is a little like sensory memory in that it's designed to let the items go. They fade very quickly. As I kept reading each new word, you probably felt the earlier words slipping away. So although most of it does fade away, a little bit of it makes its way to long-term memory, which we are now considering. Unlike the previous memory forms, long-term memory is theoretically unlimited, both in terms of quantity and length of time. Let's consider quantity. You'll never max out your long-term memory. You can max out floppy disks and flash drive and dresser drawers, but you will never max out content-wise long-term memory. Indeed, the more you learn, the actual more capacity you do have. In terms of length of time, sensory memory lasts for usually less than a second. Short-term memory we learned around 17 seconds. Long-term memory, theoretically anyway, not limited in time. So a person that lives to be over 100 years old may have memories that are over 100 years old. And if you believe in life after death, and I don't know if you're right or wrong, but if you're right, that means that your memories are not even limited by your earthly existence. So again, we'll define memory as the system that encodes, stores, and retrieves information. How did you do? Let's now consider the three types of long-term memory, starting with procedural. The word procedural might indeed remind you of the word procedure, and that's what it should remind you of. Your memory of how things are done. This is a very durable type of memory. In Alzheimer's, it's one of the last types of memory to go. You know the saying, once you learn to ride a bike, you never forget. Again, a very durable form of memory. Episodic probably reminds you of the word episode. These are not episodes of a TV show. These are the episodes of your life, the personal events. Semantic, your memory for facts. So if you think about our class, which one type of long-term memory do we have by far the most of? Consider that for one moment, then I will tell you. Is it procedural, episodic, or semantic? If you said semantic, you are indeed correct. Everything from Wilhelm Wundt to the famous uh, experiment by Phil Zimbardo that we'll see later on in the course. How did you do? Probably right, quite well, I think, but did you actually try to think of the answer for the ball at the base of the brain, or the father of the psychology, or the type of variable? If you didn't, go back and try to do that too. Let's see how you did. Hopefully you said Wilhelm Wundt for the first one, the cerebellum, for the next one, and the dependent variable for the last one. Let's try an example not covered in class. The answers will be on the next slide, but please do give it a try. Let's continue our discussion of long-term memory, looking at both the primacy effect and the recency effect. The primacy effect, remembering the beginning items better than the middle. Recency, as the word recent might suggest, remembering the last items, the end items, better than the middle. So you'll notice a distinct tendency for the middle items to be forgotten. So when you study your notes, you might want to put an extra emphasis on the middle to avoid this problem. And in children, often the middle child feels neglected, and it's often truly the case, they often do not get the fair share of family resources, whether it's pictures in the photo album or new clothes and toys, 
So make sure whether we're talking about uh, content and notes or children that you never forget the middle. Next, let's consider a type of long-term memory called the flashbulb memory. These are very vivid memories. Uh, they have strong content. You'll often be able to know where exactly you were when you learned of such an event. Some are cultural, uh, some are personal. Given this description, what do you think we should put in the blank? Will it be episodic, semantic, or procedural? I'll give you a moment to think. So episodic, procedural, or semantic. Indeed, if you were saying episodic, you were correct. People roughly my age will have the 911 tragedy as a flashbulb memory. But a traditional age student would probably have no direct memory of this whatsoever. So think of people your age and consider what might be a flashbulb memory for your particular cohort, in other words, your particular generation. A traditional age student will often say Sandy Hook. Consider your parents, your grandparents, what might have been their flashbulb memory. They might well remember when Martin Luther King was shot and when John F. Kennedy was shot. If they're older, they might remember when World War I was declared or maybe when the victory was announced and apparently all the bells of the country rung at the same time, or at least one by one as each community learned of the good news. Next for our discussion of long-term memory, we will consider the three stages. Now hopefully these three terms sound very familiar because these are the terms we use in our definition of memory. We said memory is a system that encodes, stores, and retrieves information. Let's consider encoding, and let's consider how it might be done. To do this, I'm going to give you a list of 10 words similar to what we did before for short-term memory. Listen, and when you're done, write down as many as you can remember. The words are hyacinth, azalea, amaryllis, Tulip, Rose, Daisy, Marigold, Gladiola, Delphinium, and Carnation. You can go ahead and write. Now, before I read the list back to you, let me ask you some questions. Did you get both the word hyacinth and azalea? Many students do, more often than not. Why so? You might be saying to yourself there at the beginning, oh, what's our fancy term for at the beginning? Hopefully you thought primacy effect. Now let me ask if you got both the words delphinium and carnation. If you did, why do you think you remember both? You might say that they're at the end of the list and you're correct. What's the fancy term for the end items? Hopefully you remembered recency. Now let me give you an or. Did you jot down daffodil or pansy or petunia or geranium or aster or dahlia? Very commonly I would student record one or two. And as you might suspect, no, none of these were on the list. If you thought you recognized them, that reflects the nature of encoding. The human brain does have its limitations so much of the time we record the gist of the information and the gist of this list was all one thing, flowers. Now let's consider the next item that can be effortful or automatic in this encoding process. Automatic is just it happens on its own. Most students assume that encoding will happen on its own and you'll just learn the information maybe by just reading your lecture a time or two. 
Everful is much more accurate, much more useful. For Everful, uh, maybe you might do flashcards. Maybe you might take advantage of the bonus PowerPoints. Effortful is much more effective than just relying on automatic. There's also three types of storage for this encoding. Uh, semantic, in other words, by meaning. Acoustic, by the sound or visual. So sometimes you might say, I don't remember the word, but it means this. You record it by semantic. You might say, I can't remember the name of the word, but I know it begins with a certain letter, reflecting acoustic storage or you might just record by the way things look. Now let's consider the second step of forming a long-term memory, that of storage. If we were computers, it would involve making changes on our hard drive. But since we're living beings, this storage must involve changes in the tissue of our brain. Try to remember what brain structure we noted in chapter three helps us to form memories. It had a great mnemonic, if that's a hint. If you're still in the drawing a blank, perhaps the picture at the bottom right will give you an idea. Indeed, it was the hippocampus. Neurotransmitter, that did have a mnemonic also, but not as good as our hippocampus. Did the mnemonic go for acetylcholine or dopamine? Hopefully you said acetylcholine. We said A is for Alzheimer's, A is for acetylcholine. People with Alzheimer's are deficient in acetylcholine in their brain, and typically their hippocampus is very damaged. Brain changes, we know of many brain changes that lead to formation of memories. As we form memories, the branching structure of our neuron changes, the, ah, the dendrites. Also, the membrane of our neuron changes, and even the shape of the little spaces between the cells, the synapses, they also change shape. Now let's consider the species used. Try to imagine what species it would be. It'd be the same for all other psychological research as well. If you said rodents, ah, too bad, you're actually wrong. It'd be humans. Rodents are a distant, distant second. But if we do consider the animals, rodents would be the most commonly used. Other species might surprise you. That would include the squid, because they have giant neurons and giant axon, and bigger makes easier. And also something called the aplesia, which is shown on the next slide. Let's consider an experiment that brings together both learning in the form of classical conditioning and memory. And this is the most interesting slash bizarre experiment that's ever crossed my path. In this experiment, some sea slugs were classically conditioned, others left it alone. Uh, think back, what were the two terms for groups that we might apply right here to our two groups of sea slugs? I'll pause for a moment. Hopefully you were tempted to say the classically conditioned group were the experimental group, and that would mean the not classically conditioned ones would be the control group. Both groups of sea slugs were then sacrificed, in other words, euthanized, and fed to another group of sea slugs waiting in the wings. Some got the classically conditioned meal, others got the control group meal. Now I'd like to ask you to come up with a hypothesis, one that might be test-worthy even. Bizarre is actually better in this example. So go ahead and think of your hypothesis. I'll give you a few seconds. The researchers hypothesized that the sea slugs who were fed the classically conditioned sea slugs would learn more quickly than those fed the control group, and indeed, that was exactly what they found. Human applications, not a one, let's not go there. So we've discussed encoding, we've discussed storage, but now let's consider the third and last stage of long-term memory formation, that of retrieval. In order to be able to remember information, we first must have to have encoded and stored it successfully. But to retrieve it, we must then find the neurons involved in that particular memory, stimulate them so they have action potentials, and in that way, that information will be brought from long-term memory into short-term memory. Let's consider retrieval cues. Now certainly, as we noted, being able to remember information depends on how successfully we encoded and stored the information. But retrieval typically uses retrieval cues. I'd like to compare them to road signs. In the pre-GPS and cell phone days, people relied more heavily on road signs to get to places for the first time. Similarly, in terms of long-term memory, 
Retrieval cues are rather like those road signs. They help us to identify the information, find what we're looking for. There are various types of retrieval, and as a student, you should tailor your studying to the type of retrieval your teacher might ask you to demonstrate in class. Just the overall picture. Recall is of two types, recall with cues and recall without cues. For example, if asked to name a particular famous person, if you're just given a question with no hints, well, that's recall without cues. If you're given a hint, you are now doing recall with cues. Often when students get stumped, they might ask, what is the first letter of the name? Or the teacher might just provide them with a couple of the terms associated with that famous person. So recall with cues versus recall without cues. Also, recognition. The answer lies there. All the student has to do is to identify it. Let's see if this is clear or not. For the test listed on the bottom of the page, decide if it's an example of just recall with cues, recall without cues, or recognition. When you've decided, click the answer. For an essay, for example, such as a historical essay, name the five causes of a particular historical event, the teacher is providing no hints, no cues. You have to provide the information totally on your own. That would be an example of recall without cues. So the essay, definitely recall without cues. Matching the term and the definition, if they're both provided, you might be tempted to say recall with cues, but no, that's beyond a cue. That's the actual answer. So that would be recognition. Multiple choice, you've got the question, you've got the answer. So again, it's beyond Q, it's actually, again, recognition. What was the point of the pictures? For example, you see the picture of the ecclesia. Well, that would be a just sort of question. Let's consider a very rare type of forgetting, amnesia. There are two varieties, anterior grade and retrograde, this often poses great trouble for students to learn, but try to tackle it this way. I think you'll find it very effective. If I ask most students, what does retro mean? They'll say old. Exactly. So amnesia is all about forgetting. If a person has a retrograde type, they can't remember the old information. And if retro means old, you might be tempted to say the anterior grade means new, and you would be correct. In that one, you cannot remember the newer information. So next, when that settles okay, consider the example of HM, who we discussed earlier in the course, and see if you can fill in those four blanks associated with the answer, or I'm sorry, with the question. Unfortunately for HM, he had a brain structure that was regularly short-circuiting, resulting in many, many, many seizures every day. So he had his hippocampus removed because of his Put bad epilepsy or bad seizures, and afterwards he could no longer learn the new stuff. And let's see, retro was old, so it's not the old stuff, so that had to be the new term for us, the anterior grade. So anterior grade amnesia. Hopefully you did okay on that. It's very unlikely that if you can't remember something, it was due to amnesia. In general, our inability to remember is caused by failure in either the way you encoded it, stored it, or retrieved it. Next, see if you can identify what should go in those three blanks you are now looking at. Actually, go ahead and do it. So in general, when we have a problem in memory, it's not because we had amnesia. Our problem is much more likely to be to a failure in the way we encoded the information, stored it, or in the retrieval process itself. Many people believe that memory works like a cell phone or a camera. It purposes. Many people who have not taken a psychology course believe that memory works rather like a camera 
or a cell phone and that perfectly preserves the image or the audio material, uh, that is far, far from the case. Memory is constructive in its process, uh, hence the picture I chose. Every time that you try to retrieve a memory, it has to be reconstructed. And that creates a lot of room for errors in the reconstruction process. Interference is another reason why we can sometimes fail to retrieve information. Old knowledge can interfere with the learning of new knowledge, or sometimes vice versa. Perhaps you learn one language in high school and are trying to learn a new language in college. Uh, perhaps you learned Spanish in high school and now are attempting French. Some students find that their knowledge of their Spanish remains strong, but it's exceedingly difficult for them to learn French. Other students learn the new language French very readily, but have difficulty recalling Spanish, things that were quite easy before they attempted French. So interference can affect us in various subject areas, not only just in language learning. Retrieval has been well studied, and we know that certain factors can either facilitate it or inhibit it. Let's consider the two factors of context and mood. We know that context has a strong effect. We remember better when we are in the same situation as when we first learned the information. Similarly for mood, we remember when we're in the same mood as when we first learned it. Now a test, I would not be so kind to use context and context for mood and mood, so I would use a synonym. So maybe perhaps in a moment, consider a different way of saying the word context. So when we're in the same context, how else could you say it? Hmm, maybe setting, uh, maybe environment. Let's consider now mood. How could we say mood differently? Uh, perhaps the same emotional state. A very long time ago when I was an undergraduate, I was a passenger in my friend's car and she had a fairly large tree going like maybe 40 miles an hour. Afterwards, we were sitting there and I was a little foggy since my head had hit something and there was a lot of gas escaping from the engine compartment. All I could think in my days was that whenever you see this on TV, the car always catches on fire and this was not the way I want to go out. So I was highly motivated to get out of the car as quickly as I possibly could. And if you think about it, what way would you think I would have exited? If you said using the door did not occur to me, about after a lifetime of going out through cars 100% of the time through doors and 0% of the time through windows, I rolled down the window, broken hand, flew out the window, broken foot, never having even considered trying the door, which by the way was just fine. So you can see this is a very good example of mood dependent uh, interference or forgetting. A mood vastly different than my normal one interfered with the retrieval of the information of how to get out of a car. Let's say that a student is studying their notes for a particular subject. Maybe they're somewhat interested or a tiny bit interested or maybe somewhat disinterested, maybe even bored. Then they go to take their test and let's say that they experience sheer terror. Well, they didn't study in sheer terror, so they probably are not going to recall the information very well at all. Would this be an example of context or mood difficulties? Clearly mood. So either the student could try to study in sheer terror, which I wouldn't recommend, or find ways to calm themselves during testing. Uh, perhaps our uh, student success coaches or a college counselor might be able to give you a lot of assistance in this particular regard. Let's consider an interesting experiment on context-dependent memory. In this study, some of the participants had to memorize words while scuba diving other students memorized words on the beach. Later on, they were all tested. Some students were tested where they had originally learned the words. Others were tested in a new environment. Not surprisingly, subjects who learned the words under the water recalled more words while underwater. Subjects who learned words on the beach recalled more words while on the beach. A nice, simple, sweet experiment showing context-dependent memory. Let's consider a not too fancy technical term, tip of the tongue, often abbreviated 
with the acronym TOT. I see this as a frustration primarily. The frustration you experience when you know you know something and you swear it's going to fly to the tip of your tongue any moment. And it often does. A tip though that I found useful, if it really is frustrating you, move on, but remember to go back. If it's that frustrating, your brain will unconsciously still be working on it. So when you return, often you find that the word will be there waiting for you. Hopefully that's helpful. It works for me. Let's consider another early great psychologist, German of course, by the name of Ebbinghaus, and he's associated with the forgetting curve. His method was simple but eloquent. He used himself as the primary subject. Apparently he worked affordably for himself. He had to create words for himself to memorize so he could study his pattern of forgetting. He created stimuli that are often referred to as nonsense words. These words were always made up. Uh, they always had three letters, a vowel in the center, consonants on either side, and were never a word in his native tongue. He would then study them until he had 100% accurate recall, and then he would study the pattern in which he forgot them. And the pattern fell into that J-shaped curve you see graphed out below. He found that the bulk of the forgetting occurred in the very first 24 hours. So if you look between the edge of the chart at the right angle and the two, and then follow that up, you'll see that in the first day, more than half of the forgetting occurred in the first 24 hours. He also wanted to figure out within that first 24 hours, was it more at the beginning, middle, end, evenly across it? Well, if you look where it says one hour, you'll see that approximately half of the material had been forgotten in that first hour. So clearly, within that first 24 hour period, the bulk of the forgetting occurs in the very first hour. Now consider after the first day, which is not labeled, so just before two, and followed across all the way to the right, virtually a horizontal line. Virtually no new forgetting after the first day. This is applications for your studying. Many students will study for an hour or two, can retain it, and they think that they have learned it sufficiently. Not the case. According to this chart, you'd want to go and check yourself 24 hours later. If you know it then, it's looking good. You might just need some light touch-ups every now and then. But many students don't go back to that next day test, and they assume if they know it after an hour or two, that they'll know it for the test, which is, again, often, so often, not the case. Make sure you test yourself 24 hours later. What you know at that point, you know. What you don't know, well, work on it more. Let's look at some important applications for memory research. Knowing these could actually impact a person's life, could actually mean the difference between life or death. Please go to the link and listen to this short video. Most people believe that if a person confesses, they are guilty, and if it's taken back, they tend to still think the person is guilty. And that does seem logical, but research is clear, both in the area of psychology and criminology. People regularly give false confessions, and we even know what parameters increase the likelihood of false confessions. So please, if you're in a jury, do not think that the person who's confessed is automatically guilty. I think you'll find this video very surprising. What percentage of wrongful convictions do you think are due to false confessions where the person is actually innocent but is somehow coerced into saying that they did the deed? Take a moment and guess a percentage. I'll pause. Go ahead and actually put a number into your mind. Best guess. I was surprised. It's between 15 and 25 percent. So up to one in four wrongful convictions were due to a false confession. So I think that's an amazing number. So how does this happen? Why does it happen? It's been well studied and we know some of the major factors that cause an innocent person to confess. One is the lengthy interrogations, often intensive, six hours, 
eight hours, 10 hours plus, no breaks, maybe no smoking if they need smoking, no food, just constant barragement of a trained professional and often two at the same time. Another factor is sleep deprivation. If that person has not slept, it is much more likely that at a certain point their need for sleep just causes them to tell the officers what they want to hear. And the third factor is police lies. I assume that you know from the crime sitcom dramas that police are allowed to, are allowed to lie as part of interrogation. So they often say that there's evidence against you. We have multiple witnesses. We have clear evidence. Often combined with, you can go home and we can take this up later. And that person is so wanting to get out of that situation to rest, to get away. And often said, well, your sentence will be much lighter. We, you're going to be convicted, but your sentence will be much lighter if you confess. So these are common factors. So if you're ever in a situation where you're on a jury and there's an eyewitness, I'm sorry, a false confession, a false confession that the person takes back, most jurors will say, well, the person confessed. They just changed their mind after the lawyer told them to withdraw it. Hopefully after this course, you'll know that it's quite, quite possible that an innocent person falsely confess. This might be one of the most important messages you take away from this entire course if it keeps somebody out of jail who shouldn't be there. On the first day of class on our play quiz, we had a question asking about hypnosis and memory. And many of us are surprised to learn that hypnosis actually does not enhance memory. People will actually recall more information, but the bulk of the information, or at least a scary percentage, is inaccurate. This is a prime reason why we do not hypnotize witnesses in the courtroom for fear of actually altering memory. Please go to the link and listen to this short video. Most people believe that if a person confesses, they are guilty, and if it's taken back, they tend to still think the person is guilty. And that does seem logical, but research is clear, both in the area of psychology and criminology. People regularly give false confessions, and we even know what parameters increase the likelihood of false confessions. So please, if you're in a jury, do not think that the person who has confessed is automatically guilty. I think you'll find this video very surprising. You might want to ask, how do we know a confession was false and the person wasn't, in fact, guilty? Well, often years and years and years, unfortunately, sometimes decades after the person's gone to jail based on their false confession, DNA evidence is either found or reinvestigated, clearly finding the person was not the person who committed the crime. Up to 32%, that's a third, up to one third of people that are exonerated by DNA evidence were convicted or jailed or sentences, sentenced with a false confession. Let's consider the role of eyewitness testimony in the jury process. Jurors are extremely impressed by eyewitness testimony. The question is, should they be? Well, according to research, eyewitnesses misidentify about 33% of the time, one third of the time. And they are even less accurate than that if the person is a different race than themselves. Hopefully that's shocking. If you're thinking, oh, there's too many statistics piling up, isn't it convenient this 33% is virtually identical, treated the same as in terms of DNA exonerations and false confession. So again, eyewitness testimony is a piece of evidence, should not be the only evidence. But let's consider the next slide. So let's continue our exploration of eyewitness testimony. Jurors are very impressed by it. Should they be? So far, it looks like a strong no. Let's add more information to that, more data to that. 
and accurate eyewitness identification is the single leading reason why innocent people go to jail. It is the single leading reason for false convictions, and this is based on DNA exonerations. So can you listen to eyewitness testimony? Yes. If it's the only piece of evidence, should you put a lot of weight in? Personally, absolutely no, according to research. It should be just one piece of evidence amongst many, hopefully all consistent. And if you are ever on a jury and there's an eyewitness, many times jurors are swayed by the positivity of the witness. I am positive it was him. I will never forget the face. Research shows that they are no more accurate than the eyewitnesses that says, I think it was them. It looked like him. So don't let their positivity and certainty sway you. So again, eyewitness testimony, very prone to error, very prone to issue, which could cost a person their life or their freedom. In one particular experiment on false memories, researchers recruited subjects from a psychology pool. They obtained permission to contact the subject's parents and enforce phone numbers. They then asked the parents if there was ever an episode in which the child was lost more than, I would say, a minute or two as a child. If they said yes, that particular subject was now out of the study. They only wanted subjects who had no experience of being lost. They then met the subjects again and discussed the episode in which they were lost as a child. The researchers provided many, many details, the same for every subject, of course, and asked the subjects what they remembered about the event. Subjects often claim that they remember the events and needed added on to details. As a child, I remember visiting a uncle's lake house one time. I remember dimly telling the adults that there was a bear outside. I remember that the men got their shotguns and went hunting the bear and they brought the bear back dead. I mentioned that as an adult to my mother and she laughed and said nothing remotely occurred like that. As much as I can figure, maybe I saw a dog outside and that was the extent of it. The great Swiss psychologist, Jean Piaget, shared an interesting event from his childhood. He grew up in a family that was comfortable financially and the family had a nanny. One day the nanny brought him home and she was in terrible shape, all scuffed up. She related a story in which kidnappers attempted to steal the young child, but she thwarted them. The family was very grateful and gave her a reward. Years and years later, long after she had left their employment, they received a letter from this employee begging for forgiveness. Apparently she was short on money had contrived the story, made it up, scuffed herself up. And yet Jean Piaget has distinct memories of this entire kidnapping event that never occurred. So how would he form these memories? Clearly he had heard the stories year after year being shared to every family guest and family member of the brave uh, nanny and the child that was saved. And he visualized these stories and these stories became transformed and became a memory that he thought was real and his own. So it is likely that all of us have a few memories from childhood that were not really memories of the event, but were rather stories that we had heard so many times and visualized that they became a memory that we thought was firsthand and was really just the memory of the retelling. Mnemonics could be defined as memory strategies or memory devices. You've been provided a few throughout the course, such as the hippocampus or ACE for acetylcholine. And sometimes class will share a particularly good mnemonic that becomes mine and I pass on to future generations. Are there examples that you use in your other classes, perhaps a math class, a uh, music class, perhaps? Let's listen to psychologist Phil Zimbardo teach us the PEG word mnemonic with fellow colleague Gordon Bauer. He'll only give us the pegs for one through five. You'll have to work on the six through 10 on the next slide. Did you notice how, after Phil and Zimbardo had learned the pegs, how easily and quickly he was able to learn those word pairs and do them backwards? And if you did them with him, 
you would notice that you probably had the same facilitation of behavior. Although the method of pegword mnemonics sounds silly, it is actually quite effective and can be quite useful for students. I'd urge you to give it a try the next time you have to do a certain list of words in order, a certain group of steps in order, whether it's culinary or biology. You might find it very, very useful and might use it throughout your college career.